regularly. This is the uh, final uh, program in a series of six dealing with revolution. We have taken some of the great revolutions in the history of the world, the uh, English Revolution, Civil War of the 1600s, the Glorious Revolution of 1688 in Britain, uh, the French Revolution, the American Revolution, and the Russian Revolution, and in an evening of peace and discuss them, and tonight we're rounding it off with a tying up uh, evening, trying to see if we can come to any generalizations or if there are patterns that run through uh, revolutions, uh, similarities, things to watch for, and so forth and so forth. We're centering the discussion around a book which tries to do this very thing, uh, Crane Britain's The Anatomy of Revolution. And I'll begin us tonight with, I suppose you'd say, a book review of the essence of uh, the book and what Mr. Britton has to say about revolution. Then each of the uh, men who has been discussing a particular revolution in some of the previous lectures will uh, talk briefly about his particular revolution in connection with this general theme as to whether he thinks it fits or doesn't or how valid the book may be and so forth. After that, we welcome questions uh, from you or of them to each other uh, or whatever uh, form from then on that uh, in any remaining time that you would uh, care to have the program uh, take. Crane Britton was born in Connecticut in 1898, which as you can subtract, uh, brings it down. I believe I saw where he retired uh, from his position at Harvard University uh, last year. He has been at Harvard a long, long time. He got his AB there in 1918, was chosen as a Rhodes Scholar, got his doctor's degree from Oxford in 1923, came back from there to become an instructor at Harvard and stayed on until his retirement uh, last year. He had one uh, visiting year in 1930 when he was um, at Beloit and I've forgotten the other in Colorado, some three schools around the uh, Middle West, but otherwise he's uh, been at Harvard and kind of an institution there for a long time in the field of European history and European intellectual uh, history. He's written quite a number of uh, things. The, in 1930, he wrote a book called The Jacobins, and that, I presume, got him interested in studying revolutions and the French Revolution, and probably led to uh, this book in 1938, tying it in with other, rev with other revolutions. In 1950, he wrote a rather well-known book, Ideas and Men, and in 1953, The Shaping of Modern Thought. Uh, he has others, but these are some of his uh, better-known uh, books. What he attempts to do in the anatomy of revolution is to uh, analyze uh, several revolutions and see if he can find any pattern, if indeed there is an anatomy or a framework or skeleton or something that uh, revolutions in general seem to have. He, in his first chapter, he discusses the idea, and I think he rather favors it, that history can be made a science and that, is, that it is as much of a science as some of the physical sciences. Uh, he mentions, for instance, that the, um, the physical scientist's uh, observation is simply an observation about a, uh, some natural phenomena, phenomenon and not the phenomenon itself, and that the, similarly, a well-verified historical event, something Cromwell, say, did, is just as much a fact as uh, some of the physical scientists use. Uh, he mentions that certain sciences deal with case histories, with clinical studies, and that it would be in this sense that the historian would gather his uh, facts. Now, you may want to challenge. By the way, I'm not taking either pro or con. I'm just telling you what he says, and you can like him or not like him and agree, or uh, you could anyway, of course, but anyway, I uh, present him and his ideas uh, as much as I can, just as he puts them. Um, he feels that facts are a little meaningless unless you fit them into some sort of conceptual framework, and the one that he seems to like, he considers the idea of a storm, and that revolutions are like a storm that blow up and then reach a peak and then calm down, but for various reasons, he doesn't like that one. The one that seems to appeal to him is the idea of a fever that you can see, a fe just as in a fever, you can see signs of the disease coming on, but you can't quite spot and diagnose what the disease will be. 
then the disease finally makes itself evident. The revolution, in other words, becomes apparent and obvious. Uh, the, the fever reaches a crisis, and then the convalescence is the cooling off period afterwards. All the time he's describing this, he is hastily saying he doesn't believe in an, an, in an organic theory of history, that societies are like living things, that plants or animals that live and reach a maturity and, and old age and, and die, but still he does give you this analogy for uh, what it's worth. His definition of a revolution is the drastic sudden substitution of one group in charge of running a territorial entity for another group, with a change ordinarily made by some form of violence, a coup d'etat or pooch or whatever it may be called in the individual country. He mentions the fact that revolution as a word has emotional overtones and that to some people, uh, some people like the term and favor revolutions and so they will read it with a certain particular bias or slant. Others fear it so much and dislike revolutions that no matter what happens, they will not like the leaders, they will not like what happens or what it achieves and that it's very hard. He himself uh, says he will try the best he can and I think succeeds reasonably well in this book in trying to stay uh, objective and not uh, take either a pro or con view. He says this is one difference or this is one hazard that historians face. There's a terrible temptation with historians to want to uh, change the situation. Says the physical scientist, um, or biological scientist, I guess in this case, um, doesn't want to improve the amoeba, but that historians, when they read about something happening, they wish it had been otherwise, or they, in a moral sense, would like to change or improve things. And it's awfully hard to say as objective as he wishes they uh, could. The analysis that he makes, and that I'll be discussing here, does not fit, and he recognizes that it does not fit all revolution. For instance, he singles out three particular uh, types to which it doesn't apply. Um, one, for instance, is the one type of revolution is what he calls the territorial nationalist type. This would be, I suppose, a colonial power that revolts from their imperial master for independence, uh, something of this kind. Some of the nationalist uh, revolts also of the 19th century. He says that the American Revolution was, to a rather large extent, this kind of revolution. And I suppose insofar as it was, it, we'll see in a minute, it also doesn't fit on some other grounds. It's not one of the best examples. But anyway, this is one kind of revolution that he is not attempting to squeeze into this uh, pattern of his. Another kind is the rightist revolution. And of course, in 38, when he was uh, wrote originally, uh, Mussolini and Hitler in power, this was certainly a very big issue. And we're still very concerned about rightist and fascist uh, groups and uh, how they have or might uh, come to control and he thinks studies need to be done of uh, this sort of revolution but he doesn't think that they necessarily would follow this pattern either. And finally he also doesn't consider uh, abortive revolutions, in other words ones that fail. He is considering only successful uh, revolutions and the ones that he picks then have certain things in common. They all are uh, after the medieval, in other words uh, reasonably modern in the last few hundred years. They're all in Western Europe and the Western world. They uh, were all successful revolutions. They were all popular revolutions or democratic revolutions in the sense of being supposedly at any rate for the freedom of the majority uh, as against some privileged uh, minority. So that these are uh, some of the characteristics of the four he selects. The I didn't put them on the board, and I think perhaps uh, you uh, come to the lectures re regularly, you know the four, but I might, before we get on here, uh, repeat once again the four that he selects. One is the English Revolution in the 1640s, the English Civil War. The um, Russian, re excuse me, the French Revolution, the American Revolution, and the Russian Revolution. These are the four that he uses. He doesn't claim that these are necessarily typical, that other revolutions will fit this pattern. He also doesn't feel that necessarily this gives you any predictive power, that just because this has happened that you can look and sense and see, well now we've reached this stage and next month we're going to have a revolution because we've reached society is such and such has just happened and that's the way it was at the end of 
uh, stage one. Um, as I say, America didn't go through all of the stages as perfectly to fit his pattern as the others never reached what he considered the third extremist phase and the Thermidorian reaction kind of stopped at the moderate uh, period. Rather, what he considers is that it worked rather backwards, that there was a struggle between the extremists and moderates back before the revolution ever began, and that the Declaration of Independence marked the victory of the extremists, that this is what the extremists at the time wanted, and that they kind of won out early, and the American Revolution is a little turned upside down and backwards, and uh, seems to fit in a rather nebulous uh, way. England doesn't fit too well either, and so what it boils down to is largely uh, France and Russia as the best examples, where <coughs> others coming in when occasionally they seem to uh, fit. I think the question can be raised as to how useful a pattern is by the time he hedges himself with all of these conditions as to what this doesn't apply to, whether it has any meaning at all left. But I think it is a rather provocative analysis and at least a framework when you read about revolutions to see if yours that you're reading about fits into. So let's look and see now what the pattern is. I put the general stages on the board. I'll be running through in more detail uh, what they mean. In general, revolutions go from right to left. That they start, of course, the old regime rather far to the right. The moderates would be uh, rather liberal or certainly at the very far left side of liberals verging onto the radical uh, edge and extremists even more radically to the left. Then, after you reach the crisis period, the reign of terror or whatever, during the extremist period, people tire of this, and during the, during the Thermidorian reaction, you move back once again to the right. So that you see a movement here during the revolution from probably you never get back as far right as you started, back to the old regime, but you get something <laughs> of uh, this movement. Now, let's look a minute at the, some of the characteristics of an old regime. The ruling class is a privileged group, very probably hereditary. Um, the, there is another group, or are perhaps many groups in society, which are, well, in fact, the society itself is economically progressing. Uh, revolutions usually don't come in poverty-stricken or very backward, undeveloped countries. They seem to come in societies that are uh, progressive and progressing and prosperous and so forth economically. Another characteristic is that the government, however, is financially in distress, uh, maybe actually bankrupt or on the verge of it or uh, suffering, which probably hinges on the tax system and the inefficiency of the uh, government. It isn't that the country is so poor, but that the government uh, itself is poor. Also, you get a group or groups in society that are rising economically and feel economically pinched or inhibited or hindered in various ways by the conditions and situation. Um, I have a fair number of quotations. I hope you'll bear uh, with them here. I think he puts it better than I can paraphrase or summarize, so occasionally I'll read how he puts it. Thus we see that certain economic grievances, usually not in the form of economic distress, but rather a feeling on the part of some of the chief enterprising groups that their opportunities for getting on in this world are unduly limited by political arrangement would seem to be one of the symptoms of revolution. These feelings must, of course, be raised to an effective social pitch by propaganda, pressure group action, public meetings, and preferably a few good dramatic riots like the Boston Tea Party. As we shall see, these grievances, however close they are to the pocketbook, must be made respectable, must touch the soul, what is really but a restraint on a rising and already successful group, or on several such groups, must appear as rank injustice toward everyone in the society. Men may revolt partly or even mainly because they are hindered, or to use Dr. George Petty's expressive word, cramped, in their economic activities. But to the world, and save for a very few hypocrites, also to themselves, they must appear wronged. Cramped must undergo moral transfiguration before men will revolt. Revolutions cannot do without the word justice and the sentiments that it arouses. And so, uh, as you can see then, these people who have some economic grievances must make it seem more than just a strain on their pocketbook as something wrong with the whole society and everyone. Um, social antagonism seem to be at their strongest when a class has attained to wealth but is or feels itself shut out from the highest social distinction and from positions of evident and open political power. 
Um, I think this is rather an interesting uh, statement that he makes here. He says, where wealth, certainly the second or third generation of wealth, cannot buy everything, everything of this world at any rate, you have a fairly reliable preliminary sign of revolution. And so when you get societies where the people who uh, have money uh, are excluded, can't get top government jobs or can't get commissions in the army or can't get this or that or the recognition socially, uh, as he said, the causes of revolution often are not economic ones. That you can't measure them economically because there's some of these other things that may be just jealousy or it may be some social position that you want or feeling discriminated against, which is kind of hard to put your finger on, but this is what uh, upsets people. The strongest feeling seemed generated in men who have made money and who contemplate bitterly the imperfections of a socially privileged aristocracy. Revolutions seem more likely when social classes are fairly close together than when they are far apart. So it's a group that's pretty close to the top but wants to get the rest of the way, which is perhaps likely to revolt. As he goes on to say, he says, untouchables usually don't revolt against uh, God-given aristocracy. And uh, so when the social classes are closer together, they might revolt. Another characteristic of the old regime is uh, he takes from another author who uses the phrase, the transfer of the allegiance of the intellectual. This is such a rather bulky long term that someone else shortened it to desertion of the intellectual. And although desertion has a little uh, unsavory connotation, it's so handy that he uses it too. Now by intellectual, he takes in a rather sizable group uh, writers, uh, artists, musicians, actors, teachers, preachers. I don't know if that's all inclusive, but these are some of the intellectuals that he is talking about. Um, now this group has a tendency always to be critical of society, and so this is nothing new that this group begins to desert the government and to criticize. Uh, I like his little quotation in there. He says, an intellectual as satisfied with the world as with himself would simply not be an intellectual. Um, but now, during the, this period of this unrest and discontent as the revolution approaches, the number of intellectuals seems to get more numerous, they become more vocal, both absolutely and relatively, there seem to be more of them, you hear more of them, they become more open and flagrant in their criticism, they attack rather basic things about government, about business, about society in general, and the existing institutions and suggest perhaps some rather basic uh, changes. Uh, revolutionists are uh, Im impressed by the immediacy of the ideal and something else about them in these particular revolutions. They feel that some abstract impersonal force is their perfect ally. Uh, in some cases, in in the case of the English, they may feel that it's God, that this is a, that God intends this to be, that they are simply carrying out the will of God. With the American and French revolutions, they talked in terms of nature and reason, and this is what was forcing these things to go through. This was the abstract, impersonal force. Uh, with the Russian Marxist revolution, it was economic forces, but uh, in all cases, there, there was this force. The victory of the underdog must be made to appear inevitable. Uh, and also, the present upper dogs must be shown to have got preponderance by accident or by some dirty trick while God or nature was temporarily off duty. <laughs> um, another characteristic of the old regime is that the government and leaders are inefficient. The, they themselves begin to realize this and to uh, distrust themselves and the government to lose faith uh, in the traditions and habits of their class. They, this distrust takes various forms. Some of them may uh, grow into intellectuals, go into some of these uh, careers and become intellectuals. Some of them may go off on a humanitarian uh, trend and take it out that way. Others may actually join up with some of these uh, revolting um, organizations. I use the sense revolutionary organizations, I guess uh, is a better way to put it. Um, join the attacking groups, I guess is the way Brenton uh, puts it. Such, for instance, Lafayette is a good example of one of the individuals from uh, the aristocracy who uh, joined, of course, there are many, many others. The, and I guess I've said the fact that the ruling class becomes politically inept. The issue that finally comes to a, uh, or the issue, hostility here, finally comes to a head over 
uh, some unpopular tax, and I guess this happened in every one of the four revolutions, but all of these governments tried to collect money from people who were refusing to pay. And this incident brought into out into the open two conflicting um, parties. One, the um, so that there was clear opposition between the party of the government and the party of the revolution. In each case, or in all of these four revolutions, the government tried to use force to suppress this group. But again, in each case, they used force badly. She talks a little bit about the personalities of the rulers in each case and does feel apparently that the personalities, that there's a certain role of the individual in history and maybe if some other man had been in power, things might have come out rather differently. But in any case, they, she feels that all of them shared the uh, inability to use force effectively. And this is his conclusion about this, about these revolutions that he studied. They were successful in their first stages. They became actual revolutions instead of mere discussions, complaints, and rioting only after revolutionists had beaten or won over the armed forces of the government. We cannot here attempt to erect uniformities for other revolutions or for revolutions in general, but we may suggest in very tentative and hypothetical form the generalization that no government has ever fallen before revolutionists until it has lost control over its armed forces or lost the ability to use them effectively and conversely that no revolutionists have ever succeeded until they have got a predominance of effective armed force on their side. Well, the situation then comes to a peak, the uh, issue becomes clear, the revolutionists oppose the government, the government tries to put them down, is not successful in doing so, the revolutionists take over and we move to stage number two, the first stage of the revolution or the moderate stage in the revolution. She has a little discussion at this point as to whether revolutions are planned or spontaneous. I think he doesn't, well, I think what he concludes is that they're likely to be a little of both, that there are a few people who uh, maybe saw this coming a little bit. So in general, he mentions that no one ever expects this to come on his own day. He always thinks it's going to come on his children's day, but uh, when it does come, it always surprises him tremendously that it has come so fast and uh, they, well, they don't plan it or see that it perhaps will be so immediate. But some perhaps do plan and, and lead it and all. Uh, on the other hand, they can't foresee everything, even in the Russian Revolution, which perhaps tried to be as planned as any. Many aspects were very spontaneous and didn't work out as the leaders had thought they would and so forth. He concludes that the difference between uh, whether you think it's planned or spontaneous depends on which side you're on. That if you are for the revolution, uh, you say that it's just a spontaneous thing, it just sprang up out of the people's uh, will, they just suddenly, this mob appeal, uh, and the wishes of the people just surged forth and, and uh, won out. Those who don't like revolutions say that it's planned, that some nasty group plotted it, and says this term plot is very significant in this, that it's a plot and a scheme, and that a few leaders put over on the rest of society, and as I say, which view you take depends to a very, at least partially, on whether you like what happened or don't like what happened. Um, well, at any rate, whether planned or unplanned, our moderates are now in control of the government and they begin to face some difficulties. The unanimity that they had when they were out uh, begins to vanish as they take over and have to run the government. It's easier to oppose, you can all join in this, but when you face the responsibility yourself, this is uh, a rather hard and sobering uh, factor and react on them. In taking over the government, they also assume some of the liabilities and responsibilities of the old regime and some of the things that people haven't liked about the old regime, they now don't like about them because they now are the government. I suppose, for instance, taxation. If they didn't like to pay taxes to the old regime, they don't like to pay taxes any better if the moderates are collecting them. And so some of these aspects, they now find that they aren't very popular uh, anymore either. Um, one weakness that they face also, uh, there must be a more elegant way of putting it, but all I could think was to say that they are two nice guys. Uh, they believe in freedom, in liberty, in amnesty for political prisoners and so forth. They free everyone. They believe in complete freedom of speech. They can't bear to be harsh on the opposition. And so the opposition is perfectly free to oppose and to speak up 
and uh, which they very soon do uh, very seriously. Also, this group of moderates do not use force very well either. Uh, they got into power not because they used force so well, but because the other group was so bad. They're almost as bad as the old regime in their use of force, but the other was even worse, and so they uh, won out. Uh, as Britton puts it, he says, moderates do not hate well. And uh, so, as I say, they aren't able to crush the opposition. They're much too soft-hearted and believe in compromise and moderation, just as the name uh, would say. What he says was they're not good haters, I guess, not that they don't hate the same thing. Uh, another thing that came up at this time universally in these four revolutions that the moderates faced was having to fight a war, sometimes a civil war, sometimes a foreign war, sometimes both simultaneously. And also, they were not good war leaders. Uh, for one thing, they disliked a highly centralized government and the centralized power that this uh, necessitates, and this is pretty necessary in fighting uh, a war. Uh, Madison made the statement, he says, war is the mother of executive aggrandizement. And so I say war just uh, almost by definition requires centralization of power, which this group, uh, well, doesn't take very kindly to. Um, so as they are struggling to set up this, or as they are struggling to set up their new government and get it going, a new group of, well, new groups uh, develop of rivals side by side. He refers to these as illegal governments and talks in terms of what he calls dual sovereignty. Uh, might give you some examples of what he means here. Back in Puritan times, the New Model Army and the Puritan churches, he considered, were groups that were going along simultaneously with the government. At the time of the French Revolution, the Jacobin Club. In the Russian Revolution, the Soviets. Um, and very probably, maybe all of these, or certainly many of uh, these groups, did not intend to supplant the moderate government. They simply were going to supplement it and do some things, help it along perhaps. Uh, but anyway, they uh, developed side by side uh, with these groups. Now they are free from responsibility and so they can promise a great deal more than the uh, moderate. Not only are they free from responsibilities, but they're free from scruples and are not such nice guys often as the moderates, and so uh, they aren't hindered or inhibited in uh, that sense either. The moderates face several alternatives. They can either crush these rival groups that are developing, these Ill illegal governments, as he calls them. They can try to get control of them, or they can just leave them alone. And they sort of alternate between these uh, policies. Again, they don't crush them very well because, as I said, they don't use force too well either. Uh, they can't get control of them because they don't have the attractive promises. They're more limited in what they uh, can promise. They hate to think that they are not, no longer the leaders of the revolution and that someone else is more revolutionary and popular than they. This uh, really is very hard on them, but it turns out that this is uh, what happens, that the promises of the extremists look better uh, than theirs. And if they do leave them alone, then they proceed to develop and become strong enough eventually to overthrow them. In time, the extremists, uh, as you might suspect here, get control of these illegal governments, of these rival institutions that are developing. The extremists are rather few in number and often take pride in the fact that there aren't very many of them, but that they are uh, very well organized, very highly disciplined, and with a few people, they can keep their followers at a higher fever pitch. It's hard to keep the masses stirred up for something uh, very long, but with a few extremists, uh, they stay keyed up. Trotsky made the statement, he said, the masses are politically non-existent. That they, for a while, they may get steamed up, but they quiet down and forget about things and cease to take part. And the group that stays in and always goes to the meetings and always there are the ones who form the quorum and vote things through. And pretty soon, uh, they are in control of various organizations. The extremists follow their leaders with a devotion and unanimity unknown to the moderates. And he mentions the fact that this is the sure uh, principle, the leadership principle, and that the leaders of these rival groups at the very top in particular were usually uh, extremely good, uh, uh, capable leaders. 
Now, the techniques that the extremists use in taking over and winning control are familiar, same as any pressure group, propaganda, electioneering, lobbying, parading, street fighting, delegation making, direct pressure on magistrates, sporadic terrorism of the tar and feather and castor oil sort, and so forth and so forth. Um, gradually, the extremists ease into control. Often there, in fact, I guess frequently, there is no dramatic event uh, by which you suddenly know that they are in control, and it's often hard to put your finger on uh, just when this uh, change occurs. Uh, apparently, there's usually some particular episode when that uh, the moderates do that alienates all of the conservatives and gives the extremists a chance to take advantage of the situation and use it against the moderates and go on uh, from there. But they say they don't immediately simply take advantage of the situation and go on and just when they come in is uh, well, a little hard to pinpoint. All right, now, but eventually they do get control and overthrow the moderates and take over, which brings us to the extremist phase. I like to use the analogy of a, Britain doesn't do it, this is just my own interpretation of Britain, of a snowball going downhill, and I think these revolutions start out that they, uh, the fellows who touch it off back in the old regime get something going here that in time becomes bigger and out of control and uh, well, bigger than they ever knew it would. And that's what happens, I think, with these revolutions, that they uh, sort of get out of hand and get bigger and more extreme and more radical. Um, now, let's see what sort of rulers the extremists are and what happens in this third phase. Once in government, they centralize control. They have no fears of a centralized government, and they proceed to do so. However, uh, they may in time, I guess, go on to a single person, but they usually, and maybe always, I don't know for sure, maybe some of you men will want to comment on this, but they usually have a committee. And so it, it's a centralized government at the top, but at the very top, running the centralized government is done through a committee. The centralization is partly a war measure. As I said, you need to centralize to fight the war, and so they are fighting a war, they uh, have a centralized government. In connection with fighting the war and centralization in general, there's uh, usually a lot of economic planning, too, and they don't shy away from this. They're very happy to put on price controls or whatever is needed for uh, wartime uh, exigency. They feel that decisions should be made from the top, and they take decision-making powers away from local uh, bodies, particularly if the local groups are popularly elected. And so the decisions come to be more and more uh, made and handed down from above. It takes them some time to get the government changed and to set up the instruments of terror. And so you don't get this so-called reign of terror or the crisis period for uh, some time after the extremists come to power. Uh, some of the when I say the instruments of terror, some of the things are extraordinary courts, revolutionary tribunals, uh, revolutionary police forces. Um, the, these groups, when they were out uh, of power, they were great advocates of freedom of speech and liberty and so forth. But the minute they, become, they come into power, they become very authoritarian and they don't allow freedom of speech uh, for anybody else. Gradually, they dispose of all of the opposition through these courts and rounding them up and trying them or uh, whatever. And then, with the opposition out of the road, they can be just as extreme as they like. And for sometimes several years, several months, uh, depends on the revolution and so forth, how long they're in, and this period of extremism lasts, but at least for a time, there's no one around who dares at any rate uh, well, get in the road or stop them. One interesting sidelight is that ordinary crimes like uh, robbery of ordinary criminals, robbers, cutthroats, kidnappers, and so forth, do not operate much during this period. Uh, the conservatives' explanation, it seems, is that they are now all in the government. Uh, the crisis period, or one of the features of this uh, extremist phase, the extremist leaders, uh, in fact, revolutionary leaders in general, are uh, idealists, and now they have a chance to put their ideals into practice. Uh, Britain has a long chapter, which I haven't dealt with at all here, I'll 
go off on a side a minute here to show you a little bit about it as to who revolutionists are. I won't go into all of his analysis, but he breaks down in some detail the kinds of people who make up uh, revolutionary leadership. This is the essence of his uh, chapter. He says, the revolutionists tend to represent a fairly complete cross-section of their communities with a sprinkling of the very highest ranks of their societies, men like Lafayette, for instance, and as far as the active ruling groups go, extremely few of the submerged, downtrodden, lowest ranks. This is the school of the Bolsheviks of the Puritans and the Jacobins. Bums, hobos, the mob, the rabble, the riffraff may re be recruited to do the street fighting and the manner burning of revolutions but they emphatically do not make, do not run revolutions, not even proletarian revolutions. There's, I tried to find it to put it on the uh, board for tonight, one of my favorite cartoons in that through history with J. Wesley Smith. Some of you may remember this fella comes in with the revolutionary hat on, the French Revolution looking very discouraged, and he says, he says, I tried to rouse some rabble, but they all claim that they're middle class. <laughs> so maybe this is, maybe you would have done better uh, recruiting middle class. The uh, one feature, he made a study apparently, by the way, of uh, the Jacobins and uh, who they were in society. And one of the figures, rather interesting, was that the average age of several clubs was 41 and 8 tenths years. So as he says, these were not particularly young upstarts uh, who were uh, leading, carrying out uh, the revolt. Uh, men come to power who probably would remain unheard of in other times. Uh, often, if they have a special ability or good in journalism or an oratory, they have a particular chance and become famous. Uh, in general, idealists don't get a chance to lead, but during revolutions, uh, they, they do. Um, he says, well, this gives you an example. Robespierre, I think he would assume, was uh, a typical example of such an idealist. Robespierre wanted a France where there would be neither rich nor poor where men should not gamble or get drunk or commit adultery, cheat or rob or kill, where in short there would be neither petty nor grand vices, a France ruled by upright and intelligent men, elected by the universal suffrage of the people, men wholly without greed or love of office, and delightedly stepping down at yearly intervals to give place to their successors, a France at peace with herself and the world. So that I think when you look at the aims and ideals of some of these leaders, it isn't their... Uh, what they are striving toward that we dis disagree with probably, but uh, maybe some of the methods that they use to achieve it. Um, another statement he made which gets into another uh, facet of this, or maybe it's one aspect of this idealism, all of these revolutions have at their crisis a quality unmistakably puritanical or ascetic, or to use an overworked word, idealistic. There is a serious attempt by those in authority to eradicate the minor vices, as well as what some might feel inclined to call the major pleasures. Um, we're familiar with this sort of thing, I think, particularly in connection with England. The term Puritan, Puritanical, has certain connotations, but I think we aren't so aware that the other revolutions had similar uh, movements to uh, try to make people uh, be, behave in a personal and uh, moral uh, sense. He says that the extremist attempt to enforce a life without the ordinary vices and do all of this within a very short time puts a strain on the average citizen that's very hard uh, for him to bear. And also, revolutions are very hard on privacy, that the government is uh, snooping around to see how you're behaving and perhaps punish you uh, for it and won't leave an, the individual alone, and this also is hard on him. Also, during this extremist period, uh, there are many, many changes in the average person's daily life. Uh, sometimes it's in the form of a dress. Sometimes it's in the uh, kinds of clothing. Uh, things are always being renamed. I was interested in one of the examples I hadn't realized. Maybe I could sort of told you that in connection with the revolution, that apparently the towns in France with Saint on, like in our country, Saint Louis or Saint Paul, were renamed. They were on an anti-church, anti-clerical phase at the time, and apparently during the revolution renamed, and other things that had uh, names connected. And of course, the Russians did a great deal of renaming of uh, Petrograd to Leningrad and so forth and so forth. And so things that you're used to calling one thing or something else, your calendar is different, your playing cards are different, your clothes, many, many things. And this begins to kind of uh, 
apparently get on the nerves of the average person, in addition to the fact that you're very insecure and you never know when this revolutionary tribunal may call you up and you're living on tenor hooks all the time and it's a very uncertain and not too pleasant uh, kind of life for uh, what he calls the outsiders, the people who aren't in, aren't running the revolution. Even for the group he calls the insiders, he says they get sick of it too. They get tired of going to the meetings and being part of it and all the demands that government makes and some of them drift out and become outsiders and don't want to uh, take an active part uh, in the <coughs> He had quite a discussion uh, making a parallel to all of this to a religion and how this has, uh, is somewhat like a religion. Uh, the part of religion he thinks is particularly relevant is that under a religion's influence, men work hard and excitedly to achieve in common an ideal, here or somewhere. Um, Calvinism, Jacobinism, Marxism are all rigidly deterministic, but still these groups, uh, this has always seemed terribly illogical to me, but anyway, they still work very hard to uh, bring them about, and this is another characteristic uh, that they have. He doesn't like the term religion because he feels to say that these revolutionists or their revolution, re revolutionary ideals are a religion to them because this has other connotations, but he can't think of any other word that has quite the same meaning. So if you think of any he could use, he apparently would be glad to get another word, but I think you can see what uh, he's driving at. Um, the These extremists combine very high ideals and, as I said a, a few minutes ago, a complete contempt for inhibitions and principles which serve both men as ideals. They're practical men un unfettered by common sense. I like this expression. He says they're Machiavellians in the service of the beautiful and the good. So that this is the what I was getting at, that we, I think, don't quibble with their ideals, but perhaps with some of the um, means by which they would achieve them. He says, in general, only a sincere extremist in a revolution can kill men because he loves man, attain peace through violence, and free men by enslaving them. Such contrast in action would paralyze a conventionally practical leader, but extremists seem undisturbed by it. So uh, this is the uh, situation then with these, these, these extremist leaders. There's another little phrase he put in. He says, extremists are the type of person who would never bunt. Um, the enemies are regarded, and this is this religious analogy, the enemies are regarded as sinners. And since they are sinners, it, you have a uh, right, even perhaps a duty, to eliminate them. And so this justifies the uh, uh, guillotine, the firing squad, uh, or similar practices. The, Well, during this extremist period then, you get the strains of war, you get shortages caused by war, you get very intense class struggle, and as he puts it here, he says, thus the stresses and strains of the early stages of our revolution make it easier to work the nation into war, and the war itself increases the stresses, accustoms people to violence and suspense. War makes for economic scarcity, and economic scarcity sharpens the class struggle, and so on in a merry round robin. Uh, and then the summary of this then is, for it would seem to be an observable fact of human nature that large numbers of men can stand only so much interference with the routines and rituals of their daily existence. It would also seem that most men cannot long stand the strain of prolonged effort to live in accordance with very high ideals. So I think the gist of all this is that in time people get pretty sick of the extremists, of the reign of terror, with the violence, with the <coughs> well, both the violence and the virtue, both the terror and the virtue of this, and are ready or looking forward perhaps to someone who will end this and kind of get back to the calmer, quieter way things used to be. And so this leads us then, or leads revolution to the fourth stage, what we call the Thermidorian reaction. The, I think probably you're all familiar with it, but I'll go over it anyway. Uh, the source of, sometimes we just call it Thermidor II for in short. It's simply the term comes, of course, from the French Revolution when this particular phase of the revolution came with the fall of Robespierre. And this happened to come in July uh, in 1794. And that by their new calendar at the time was the new month of Thermidor, the hot month. And 
So from that time on, although technically this only applies to France, it's become a universal term for this fourth phase of any revolution. And it's the calming down, cooling off, back to normal, however you want to regard it, phase of a revolution. Uh, one point that you mentioned I think we should keep in mind is that when we say back to normal, uh, it means back to normal for that country. And you can't expect Russia to go back to the England of habeas corpus or to the uh, United States of the constitutional making times or uh, whatever, that it probably will go back to something not too far from the, uh, some of the Tsarist uh, characteristics or uh, whatever. So it, it, there's no particular necessary normal. It's what had been you know, normal for that particular country. Some of the characteristics of this uh, are a moral letdown. It's kind of like a pendulum. They've all been behaving themselves very well. Now you get to swing very much uh, the other way. Um, the, uh, and all, many, many changes in uh, dress, in amusements of the people, in corruption in general. I guess you've had some corruption in the extremist phase in government and the draft, but now the um, speculator uh, in government the, uh, is now an honored figure, and this is not frowned upon any longer. And um, Some of you that are old enough to be around when Forever Amber was a best-selling book and movie uh, I always think this expresses about as well as any other example I can think of of the uh, life of the uh, well, post-revolutionary uh, period. The, so there's a general moral uh, letdown. There's power by a tyrant in the Greek sense of simply an illegal ruler. He may not be tyrannical particularly or a dictator. Uh, revulsion against the terror leaders uh, perhaps putting them to death or driving them out of the country, getting rid of them. Uh, a gradual seeping back of the exiles who have fled the country begin to come back home again. This is your moving back once again to the right, a return to daily life. Uh, the person who really can do the most or should do the most with this particular period is the social historian who discusses or writes about uh, amusements and dress and clothing and activities and this kind of thing because here you see uh, many, many of these changes taking place. Well, so ends the revolution. Now as to his general uh, summaries as to whether there have been any lasting results from all of this uh, furor. He didn't seem to come up with too many of them. I don't know whether he just neglected this particular phase or whether, uh, I think maybe he wasn't so interested in this, but among the ones he mentioned are an improvement in government, government efficiency, in governmental efficiency and particularly, particularly in administration. For instance, now I guess they can collect taxes better. You don't have to have these rival organizations or illegal government side by side doing some of the things that the government in general is better able to, uh, well, govern itself and um, collect its taxes on the government. Another change is a transfer of property from one group to another, uh, probably through a good deal of confiscation or forced sale. Some groups have lost their land, others in turn uh, get it. You don't get a complete change in the ruling class. There's some carry through. I think we see it with somebody like Talleyrand who manages to hold on and go all the way through and come out on top after the revolution is over. But he's not the only example. The, it isn't a, a complete switch of rulers. There's some amalgamation, some of the old, but now some, uh, some new rulers as well. One interesting thing that I think is worth considering, I don't know whether I agree with him or not, but I think it's rather provocative, is the fact that he feels that social arrangements are the very slowest to change. And he mentioned some of the legislation that was done in some of these revolutions on the family and family life and how the legislation was rather drastic. They had very few uh, results and went on pretty much unchanged and pretty soon the government was forced to turn around, come back and modify uh, its legislation and uh, didn't achieve very much. And you mentioned the fact that in Turkey and in Japan, you both had much greater changes in social life of the people. And raises the question, I don't know that it's a very convincing argument, but maybe Eastern societies uh, change faster than Western societies in uh, some of their social institutions, which is an interesting thought, whether it uh, will bear up under uh, consideration, I'm not sure.
finally the revolution to become part of our history and an acceptable part so that uh, we think of freedom and liberty and people revolting for these things as a good thing and part of our tradition, something we believe and stand for and all of these countries uh, likewise do. A piece of coastal achievement came after these revolutions and he doesn't go into it much, but he thinks that a wider study might possibly show that feeble and decadent societies do not undergo revolutions and that actually revolutions are perversely a sign of strength and youth in uh, societies. Now, so much for Britain's views. Uh, we'll see whether uh, these men think Britain's right. Um, Dr. Schrader talked a few weeks ago on the English Revolution in the 1640s, and he'll tell you what he thinks of Britain in regard to that revolution. I don't have much uh, <coughs> here. <laughs> that was a very interesting talk, but. Uh, I don't think the English Revolution fits this uh, pattern. And uh, I could say various things about it. I've just picked out a couple of things. In number one, you talk about the desertion of the intellectuals. I don't think this fits the England of the 1640s. I'm not quite sure what an intellectual is. <coughs> According to Mr. Brinton, this includes everyone except the horny hand peasants, I guess. <laughs> but I don't think they deserted Charles. Uh, for every Milton that you can point to, you can point to an Edward Hyde, a great historian. And I might point out that the royalist capital of England for four years was the city of Oxford. And Charles got some of his main support from the university there. And if we haven't got intellectuals at universities, I don't know where they are. But uh, here you have, I think, one of the elements that, that doesn't quite fit. You, you can, uh, sort of like putting a number nine foot into a number nine shoe, I guess. You can put it in there, but it's not too comfortable as far as this, uh, these points are concerned. <coughs> Another point in num number one was that the ruler lost control of the armed forces. Well, <clears throat> you can't blame Charles on this account because he didn't have any armed forces. <laughs> there wasn't any English army. There isn't any English standing army until uh, after Cromwell's time. So there weren't any armed forces to lose control of. There weren't any armed forces really to use ineffectually. But armed forces there were, were under the control of civic organizations. Then, when you get to points two and three, the moderates and the extremists, you've got two more terms that I'm not quite sure about. And I'm afraid, in some respects, in the English Revolution, the moderates were more extreme than the extremists, and the extremists were more moderate than the moderates, at least according to. Mr. Brinton's definition of these terms, because I think he would lump Oliver Cromwell and the New Model Army and so on among the extremist group, while he would place the Presbyterians and Parliament and so on in the moderates. Yet as far as centralization of government is concerned, if this is something the extremists want, this is really something the moderates wanted, more than the extremists, as far as religion was concerned, they wanted a central Presbyterian religion. And the real extremists never get control in England. Cromwell was actually well to the right. The real extremists, the diggers and so on, uh, never take control at all. I don't think there was a reign of terror in England. I don't think you can call cutting off the king's head a reign of terror. Uh, there was no <coughs> widespread series of executions. People lost property, and this may be terrible, but I don't think it's a reign of terror if uh, you lose property, if you pick the wrong side uh, in a war. And also, uh, I think Mr. Brinton would 
start the Thermidorian reaction as far as the English Revolution is concerned, 1653, with the dissolution of the Rump Parliament. Well, if he's going to do this, he has the rule of the major generals when you've got all of the snooping and so on taking place after this time when it really should take place, I suppose, back in number three in the extremist period. And I'm not denying that the Puritans were puritanical, but I can also point out that there is a well-known description of Oliver Cromwell at a party where he seemed to get great delight in trying to throw bonbons down the dresses of the ladies there, <laughs> so maybe they weren't all so puritanical. I think what Mr. Britton has tried to do, basically, is to take the French Revolution, and the terms here are basically the terms of the French Revolution, and he tried to squeeze some other revolutions into this framework. And I think the 1640s in England, that revolution, is one that is most difficult to squeeze in this particular framework. That's all I have. Dr. Mayfield had the glorious revolution of 1688 that Britain doesn't even consider, and so I'm going to say this is not applicable either, and he'll tell you more specifically why. I'm really an interloper, because as I say, uh, Britain does not consider the revolution of 1688 at all. He mentions uh, five uniformities of revolutions, and only two of them can apply to the glorious revolution. In the first place, England was definitely on the upgrade economically, so we'll concede that. In the second place, uh, James did lose the support of the intellectuals, those who were Protestants. The Catholic intellectuals remained loyal. So I don't know whether you could really just lump all the intellectuals together. They, uh, there was no bitter class antagonism in this fight. It was a matter of office holders who had lost their job, or office holders who were about to lose their job, who wanted to keep them. And they managed to change kings. The uh, Fourth place, the government of 1688 was not inefficient. It was a relatively efficient government. It wasn't falling apart at the scene. And the fifth characteristic, or the fifth uniformity that Brenton mentioned, that the old ruling class had lost its self-confidence. This is the last thing that was going on in 1688. They had not lost their self-confidence. They were more confident than they'd ever been confident enough that they could throw out a king, choose another one, and uh, fit him pretty well into the mold they wanted. So, for these reasons, I question my right to even appear here. <laughs> I feel very fortunate. I have one that's at least applicable. Uh, and I was allotted eight minutes, so I think I'm going to take the eight minutes just for fun. I should like, first of all, to register my objection to Britain's basic idea of history, which is organic. Uh, I do not find that societies and nations have arms, legs, heads, and hearts, as he does, although he denies that he does. And I cannot agree that uh, the ills of societies are the result of some malfunction of these organisms. My basic objection to this is that this makes the historian little more than a doctor, whose principal function is to diagnose the ills of society. Actually, I might say that it makes the historian into little more than a coroner, since after all, the body is dead on which he's practicing his trade. I should like also to register my protest against <coughs> Britain's basic scheme, which leads him to impose upon the phenomenon of revolution a pattern of cause and effect relationships which do not really exist. Somehow, Britain's work seems to me too past, too linear, 
too clearly predetermined. It smacks too much of Kantian positivism, too much of the science of society in which there's really too much science and not enough society. Uh, I'm not looking at you. <laughs> I really realized, of course, that uh, Professor Britton was trying to break out of the mold in which he believed history had fallen. His work on the Jacobins, which Dr. Juhas mentioned, was published before his anatomy, had as its subtitle, An Essay in the New History. The new history being essentially something quite old, though relatively new in that Britain had at his disposal a number of research tools not previously available. It has been stated that much of Britain's uh, work and many of his ideas were derived from the French Revolution. Uh, I would take some exception to that. I don't think he understood the French Revolution very well. Uh, he had a great tendency to oversimplify in order to make things fit into his pattern. And I would like to give you four examples of this. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind is that, is that his picture of the Jacobins is overly simplistic and much too clearly drawn to be accurate. The typical Jacobin of whom he speaks in both of his books was more the Jacobin of whom Robespierre spoke than the real Jacobin who served the revolution. There were many Jacobin types, not one, and they do not fall quite as clearly into the enlightened vanguard as Britain would have us think. Moreover, he overlooks the fact that even at the height of Robespierre's power, there were many Jacobins who did not clearly fit the mold and yet retained membership in the organization in good standing. <clears throat> Moreover, much as he did in his first book, Britain ascribes to them in the anatomy a much greater role than they really played. He minimizes too readily the role of other popular clubs, particularly the Cordeliers, and the important role of ordinary citizens who were not necessarily members of any organization, but who performed their assigned tasks and supported Robespierre simply because they considered it to be their patriotic duty. In dealing with the fall of the moderates, this is the end of phase two, uh, which he sees as one of the uniformities of revolutions, Britain is simply too deterministic in suggesting that this is an inevitable development and that it was bound to come because the pendulum always swings farther to the left. The principal causes of the fall of the moderates in the French Revolution were two. One was the treason of the king. The other was the inability of the Girondists to run the war. He claims in that chapter that the moderates always fall because of their belief that they must out-radical the radicals and have no enemies to the left. But a closer reading of the history of the French Revolution would have shown him that the moderates who control the National Assembly and subsequently the Legislative Assembly had no inclination in a direction, no need to placate the radicals, because as a matter of fact they felt quite secure in their middle position reinforced as they were by the control of the National Guard, which was in their hands, and also the electoral laws, which disfranchised most of the masses. So the moderates need have no fear. <coughs> Since he engages in speculation as to what might have happened, I feel free to do the same thing. And I suggest that had the king been loyal, the constitutional monarchy would easily have weathered the crisis brought on by the war. The revolution would probably not have gone beyond the bounds it had reached in April 1792, and still it would have been a full-fledged revolution, and I think it would have qualified for his book. The fact that the overthrow of the moderates came from circumstances rather than from some uh, inexorable force of history was thus conveniently overlooked in order to make it fit into one of the so-called uniformities. Britain's success is not much greater in his search for confirmation of certain uniformities in, in the causes of the four revolutions. In relating the origins of the French Revolution, he omits any reference to the aristocratic revolution as an extremely important factor in the disintegration of royal authority. The curious thing is that Lefebvre's work on this subject, which is probably the best, was available to him 
a statement borne out by the fact that he quotes Lefebvre when it suits him. Could it be that since the aristocratic revolution was, in a sense, a revolution in reverse, and therefore against the stream of, revolution, of the revolutionary pendulum, that Mr. Britton chose to ignore it? In every revolution, asserts Professor Britton, there is a thermidor, at which time the extremists are thrown off and the moderates return to power. His description of the original thermidor, the fall of Robespierre, greatly oversimplifies the causes or simplifies the causes of this fall by making the principal actors of these events subject to the dark forces of a revolutionary disease. Mathieu and others have long ago suggested that Robespierre fell on 27 July 1794 primarily because of a tactical blunder on his part. He failed to name those whom he wished to have executed, and therefore every member of the convention felt threatened and voted to guillotine him before he had a chance to guillotine them. You may wish to argue, of course, that Robespierre's blunder was caused by the dark forces of history, but I'm afraid that this will put you somewhere between St. Augustine and Karl Marx. Uh, uh, Britain's purpose, of course, is not to present histories of, of the revolutions, but rather to offer suggestions as to the similarities between them. However, I think that most of his comparisons are outrageous. There are two examples. At one point, he compares the philosophers of the 18th century with the intellectuals of the revolutionary movement in Russia. These men were as different in temperament and outlook and in thinking as can possibly be. The philosophers were rationalists looking for the laws of nature. Above all, they were not revolutionaries, and it is difficult to portray them as such without doing serious violence to the truth. The Russian intellectuals, on the other hand, where uh, fall, fell into two categories, essentially either nationalist romantics or scientific Marxists. And to bracket these two schools of thought is indeed a gross oversimplification. The second instance of mismatching which comes, to, uh, which comes to mind is the coupling of Robespierre's theory of revolutionary government with that of Lenin. The Marxists themselves would be the first to criticize this marriage of convenience, for as I suggested in my lecture, Robespierre was really a moralizing petty bourgeois whose ideal man was not much better than a capitalist warmonger. Uh, undoubtedly, you have gathered by now that I don't think much of Mr. Brinkman's book. Uh, I must qualify my criticism, however, with some remarks which I think take some of the edge from my criticism. Basically, I believe that Brinkman's idea was good. He did try to take revolution out of the realm of the mysterious and to place it into the realm of those things which we understand and accept, sort of fatalistically, I suppose, such things as the plague, flood, and other cataclysms, which, after all, are part of daily life. For this, I think he should deserve much credit, for he has helped to break down some of the mysticism which surrounds revolution. He did open some new roads for the historian, suggesting that much can be gained from the comparative history of certain phenomena which seem to have no geographical or national boundaries. And I think that some of his conclusions have validity, especially the broad areas dealing with a totalitarian personality and the totalitarian system. I think the basic problem with undertakings such as the anatomy of revolution is that they're based on a misunderstanding or perhaps I should say an overestimation of history. A comparative history such as this is based on the assumption that one can leap from one period to another, from one country to another, and establish clearly delineated parallels between areas, events, and people. <coughs> this overlooks the fact that history is largely circumstantial, that each generation determines what it thinks of itself, of the world, of the past, and of the future, on the basis of accepted myths and harsh realities. Given geographic dispersion, and more importantly, the displacement in time, no conclusions valid for one society in one period can possibly be even remotely valid for another in a different society in a different time. Professor Britton, to the contrary, his history does not repeat itself, except in the meaningless terms of very broad generality, such as there will always be in England. Uh, <coughs> Dr. Trader is very thankful for that. <laughs> In the final analysis, we should be grateful as students of history that such keen minds as those of Mr. Britton choose to dedicate their energies 
to the search for new approaches to old problems. And we should be careful to extend our gratitude to their suggestiveness rather than to the finality of their conclusion. Thank you. <coughs> I too have prepared a speech on the back of a checkbook. <laughs> coming uh, at the end of four individuals who all challenged Crane Brinton's anatomy of a revolution as not being a very exact anatomy of their particular revolution. I have the value of uh, cutting part of my comments down and saying that I agree with all that has been said, that there is no anatomy of a revolution. There are the separate examinations of separate revolutions and an attempt on the part of Professor Brinton to create an anatomy. Generally, as I think uh, Dr. Mayfield has pointed out, in terms of the French Revolution, and according to Dr. Couture, not too accurately in those terms. I also, specifically about the Russian Revolution, was troubled over statements such as the moderates and the extremists when you consider the, what is supposedly the moderate period of the Russian Revolution from October to November, you find the moderates engaged in a terribly destructive war for what is essentially very extremist objectives, such as the obtaining of Istanbul, or the obtaining of parts of Romania, Poland, and parts of Germany, and the type of extreme actions in terms of the sacrifice of many of their people in the uh, bloody Second Bruchlau Offensive, which certainly is not moderate by any means. <coughs> uh, since really there isn't any anatomy of a revolution, and uh, since obviously Professor Brinton expected to be challenged on some of the broad generalizations that he has made, I believe what we have to do is try and explore the purpose of Professor Brinton in writing such a work. In the first place, I don't believe that it was written for the uh, present practice of promotion. In the 1930s, there wasn't that much pressure on the faculties to publish or perish, and therefore this is not an example of academic trash uh, with which the market is now overloaded. And if it isn't that, if it isn't for the purpose of publish or perish, uh, what other purposes could there have been? Once again, I don't believe it was for the purpose of profit, because the market in uh, books at this particular time, books of this nature in 1938, 1939 would not have been too great. You could make much more money analyzing the sex, ha sex habits of the Nazis. Uh, <laughs> so once again, uh, I don't think profit was behind it. I do, however, believe that uh, Professor Britton was motivated by intellectual problems of his own age. There had been two rather recent revolutions, both of them right-wing revolutions, fascist nature, and uh, both of them turning into nightmares for their people. There had been, of course, the great Russian Revolution, which in the terms of uh, many immigrants was also a nightmare for their people. The Far East was being troubled with revolution. Uh, China, of course, was undergoing a nationalization process and uh, the throwing out of the white devils finally once again causing trouble and confusion about revolution. I think it's also important to point out that men had been, historians in particular, had been predicting the downfall of Western civilization. Actually, from the time of Gibbon's decline and fall of the Roman Empire, men had constantly been looking and making analogies about when Western civilization was going to decline and fall. And uh, Oswald Spangler's two-volume work on the, of the, fall, of the decline of the West uh, came out around 1920, 1921, and it had a profound effect upon almost all intellectuals and historians. And Spengler looked upon revolution as the beginning of the process of the decline of civilization, and particularly did he view the wave of uh, revolution and disorder and anarchy that was coming from the East as this dangerous thing. In fact, if you, some of you recall 
some of Spengler's uh, statements. He calls upon men to stand in the doorway, or supposedly you're in the in the uh, same position that the Romans stood in Teutonburg for to fight off the evil barbarians, so on down the line. Now, in short, men were troubled by revolution. And I believe that what Professor Britton was trying to do, now, of course, I'm doing exactly what he's doing. He's not here to refute me. And uh, I'm making generalizations about his motivation, just as he was making very great generalizations about the motiva motivation of Marxists and uh, Jacobins, Girondins, Puritans, etc. And uh, unfortunately, though, someone can check with him if they want to and ask him whether this is true or not. I believe he was trying to justify revolution, trying to explain it to people, trying to make revolution acceptable to people. Now, that doesn't mean that he's a conspirator, that he's involved in any attempt to uh, revolutionize his own government, but he does point out, I think, a very uh, serious statement in the first part, first chapter of the work, that it's been 200 years since the American people had a revolution and that our attitude towards revolution was a rather sterile one, a rigid one. Revolution is evil. Revolutionaries are evil. That no good can come from revolution. And by picking the revolutions that he did, and he picked them deliberately, not only because he could make the number eight and a half fix him to fit into the eight shoe, but he picked them also because it would appeal to the American audience. An English revolution, an American revolution, the glorified French Revolution, and then the Russian Revolution. A very careful uh, choice of revolutions. He could have picked a lot that uh, he could have called Thermidor, etc., and looked upon as left wing, that weren't so nice, weren't so acceptable. We can accept the English, we can accept the American, of course, it was a good revolution. The French, as we pointed out, they have been sufficiently glorified in literature to be acceptable, and now we can accept the Russian Revolution. And this, I think, essentially was his purpose. Now, Probably you can quote the lines of Eliot, but that's not what I meant. That's not what I meant at all, but I think this is an indication. Also, he was calling for, in history, the application of imagination to past historical events. And this is one of the downfalls of historians for the most part. They become involved with a careful analysis of each particular event to the point that they can no longer utilize their imagination. They don't bother with the great generalizations of history. And uh, of course, the danger is obvious. When you do bother to deal with the great generalizations of history, you're almost always wrong. And any expert in any field can uh, tear apart your, your generalization and the, uh, the type of factual evidence you bring to support the generalizations, unless, of course, you do a specific five or six volume study on every conclusion that you try to come to. And of course, if you do that, no one will read it, as Toynbee has found out. <coughs> So, this then is my analysis of the anatomy of revolution. As a work of history, as we think, as historians think of history, it is not a good work. But as a work of imagination, it is a very excellent one, calling for people to stretch their minds a bit and maybe the truth also. As <laughs> an explanation to the American people to make them a little less rigid about the concept of revolution, it is also an excellent thing and a very subtle uh, work also because it constantly compares to the American Revolution other revolutionary movements which justifies them and I think this is one of the overall purposes of Crane Britain's work. But once again I, I think Crane Britain has the right to say that's not what I meant, that's not what I meant at all. Thank you. We haven't left you much time, but perhaps about seven minutes, if you want to use it that way, in questions that may have occurred to you during the course of the evening. Does anyone? Well, I was, I was wondering, I don't know if this is a comment of mine or some I particular. I'd like to hear what someone did. The historian uh, talked about it, but uh, since this is largely a group of historians, there are a couple of things. First of all, you seem to be from the book and on up dealing with revolution which has gone on some time ago and uh, admittedly some either tonight admittedly or even in the book the American one the English one doesn't fit so all you've got left is who which is suitably in the past and I say if we uh, we should look at this theory maybe if it's worth looking at and to that extent of course from the historian's point of view but what about the modern ones in other words I think we can see this pattern uh, passing through some of the, uh, the Mexican Revolution, for instance, uh, certainly the early patterns in the Cuban Revolution and the Chinese. It seems to me this is, uh, well, let's not go quite back so far and see how this is applicable to a real 
social revolution. And then the other thing I'd like to find out, um, we've dealt a lot with uh, personalities, groups, organizations who are running the revolution, and pretty well discounting uh, the masses. In other words, they were something there to be led, to be drawn into this thing uh, at the whim of the intellectuals or the dissatisfied semi-upper class. And uh, it seems to me that uh, where you have these real revolutions, you have a, a, a tremendous movement of the people with tremendous dissatisfaction without this. Uh, this kind that would fit into this model simply doesn't exist. It was the case in the United States and the English ones, but where you had this unrest has been uh, presumably in France, certainly in the Soviet Union, and certainly in Mexico, China, and Cuba, uh, this thing seems to go on better. And I was wondering if the panel would care to comment on this rather disorganized, non historical view of the thing. Any volunteers? <laughs> <laughs> You can comment. The revolution of 1688 has been called a talent revolution because it was engineered or managed essentially by the upper classes. But it was also a mass movement. The, the mass of the people in England were excited about this thing, principally on the basis of the religion. But they were excited about it, and they they uh, <coughs> were not supporting the king. When the bishops went to power, the crowds were on the streets and, and in mourning and on their knees. And when they came out of it, uh, the court room free, while they built bonfires, they cheered, they uh, they celebrated all night. This, the mass was involved in the Christian uh, religion. I can comment on some of the earlier ones. <coughs> Uh, I think perhaps the question is based on uh, uh, the overestimation of the power of the mass. I think we have this perception today that uh, revolution generates itself, uh, mass movement generates itself as something which is uh, the, only, the only person I can think of is truly generic, self generating the mass. Uh, it seems to me that uh, the masses are basically amorphous. They, they represent a force, it's true, but there's nothing else by the number of their bodies. Uh, but uh, it is a force which has to be directed, which has to be uh, guided, which has to be uh, prodded, and so on. I think this is what those two discover. I think it's very much in the French Revolution. And uh, perhaps we haven't done justice properly to the role of masses, but um, I don't think that revolutions are spontaneous. Well, without the dissatisfaction, can you any longer fly? You know, the movement. I mean, if we start a revolution in the United States, there's well, not people dissatisfied enough. We can start our own. Napoleon made a fine statement about that. He said it's not reality that what matters is what people think reality is. And if you can get a small group of people to convince the masses that uh, you know, reality is one thing or the other, you can get them to do what they can tell. See, one of the curious things about the French Revolution, which you pointed out many times, is that the conditions of the bishop in 1789 are different from nearly 200 years. Uh, going back to about 1618 uh, to the Regency of Louis XIII. And yet there had been no revolution, there had been occasional bread riots, there no mass movement, because the masses were not arguing. But they tended to polarize around 1789 because they had been given a vocabulary. I, I don't know, there's been some questions in the last year. We were clarified. I think there's another reason why we can't answer that question. The mass doesn't write, it doesn't. Um, Leave historical records that the historian can use to analyze it. Public opinion polls didn't exist to find out what the average French peasant was thinking. Um, nor did the techniques that we have today for analyzing totally what public thought are. And it's an amazing thing, even with our scientific methods for analyzing public thought, two opposing presidential candidates can come out with separate conclusions as to what people actually want or don't want. 
So it's difficult really to decide what it is that the masses want because it's, they're not a literate group in that sense that they write or they read letters or that they, uh, they can, their ideas can really be ascertained. And revolutions often consist of very astute men who analyze either how far the people can be pushed or how far the people are willing, in a sense, to let these revolutionists express whatever it is that they may or may not want. The only thing you can tell about what the people are thinking is when they start burning churches or burning uh, uh, landowners or blowing up manor houses. Then you have an idea that there's unrest. <laughs> The point is though that they have to want something. In other words, they have to want the the, the nobility's land, or they have to want bread, or they have to want uh, different religious expression or something. In other words, that need, that desire for something has to be there before you can lead them on to, to do something violent about it. That's the only thing that's supposed to be. I think the desire is always there in the cases I've been involved with there. The peasants could always be ready for a revolution if you find them quite the right example. Even if you find someone who poses as a dead star, uh, claiming that he's the, uh, a man who might have been killed 30 years before. And you can get a good revolution of dissatisfied peasants if you can find a man able to trick them into believing that now is the time for them to revolt. But revolution takes place when the intellectuals, and the uh, middle class and the group that actually counts, writes, reads the record, and does the reading is ready for the revolution or is successful, not necessarily ready, but successful during that revolution. And so, uh, how do you do? I don't think the mass counts that much. There has to be a certain amount of discontent, but not that important. <coughs> I might comment from Britain's viewpoint, maybe I didn't do him justice. I think that in, when he talked about who is a revolutionary, he mentioned that it was a cross-section of society and almost everybody except perhaps at the very, very top that there were representatives in all classes. And uh, then also in connection with was it planned or spontaneous, I think maybe you would take kind of a compromised view and agree with what you've all been saying that you do need the spontaneous element and you need the masses, but partly it's planned someone leads them on, but probably you could agree that you know, they, they have to want something for them to lead them on to. It might take about one more question. Anyone have one? I'm struck by the intensity of the historian, historical particularism. I wonder, uh, speaking from a positivistic position, uh, <laughs> uh, at what point, if ever, do you anticipate any kind of generalization within the discipline, or have you, in effect, uh, given up hope in this direction? <laughs> 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 On that optimistic note, we can end our series. We thank you all very much for coming to the series that we've had, and we hope we'll see you next year at the Social Science Spring Lecture Series. was recorded by the Library Film Service of Ball State Teachers College, Muncie, Indiana.